Well, hi everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 225 of Goulet Q&A. And uh, got a lot on my mind this week. I have a hurricane that's kind of coming our way. That'll sober you up pretty quick. Um, thankfully, it looks like it's not going to be a direct hit where we are. Here in Virginia, of course, it's going to be a direct hit for somebody else, um, which kind of stinks. So it looks like it's going to pound into Carolina's pretty good. It's probably already hitting, actually, by the time that this video goes out. So my thoughts and prayers are with everybody who's in the path of that right now. It's very close to home. I have some relatives in that area. Um, some of our, uh, you know, distributors are in that area, too. So, like, I know some people in that area. And, and we're going to get um, at least a decent amount of rain dumped on us here. Uh, Virginia, we're, like, maxed out. Like, our water table is full. Rivers are, like, at capacity. So we might get some pretty gnarly flooding that will happen this weekend. Of course, our team is, like, number one priority, um, making sure that everybody's safe and that they can be with their families and stuff. So we're, we're on, like, high alert this weekend. Um, so appreciate everybody who's been kind of thinking about us, um, giving us your love we appreciate that very much we are taking care of at the moment but it's going to get pretty gnarly in the next 24 hours here or so so um you know it's probably going to cause some delays in terms of shipments coming in shipments going out just because it's going to kind of wreck uh the mid-east uh for a little bit there so um you know hopefully it's it's not as bad as what they're predicting but they're predicting it to be kind of the storm of a lifetime so we'll see how that goes Eesh, yikes um but anywho um, did want to just give a, give a reach out uh, if you've been watching this video regularly and you haven't subscribed yet Go ahead and do that because we're gonna be coming out with some cool videos coming up soon uh, And I want you to be able to get those so subscribing to our channel helps us out helps you out and it uh, keeps good content coming your way um, Let's see here this week so far. We've done a right now on the Twisby go did that on Monday with Drew That was pretty fun got to take it to the park show you how to, how to fill it and all that um, and then on Wednesday, I did one with Eric on uh, Retro 51. And I wanted to show you some of the new Retro 51s that we have in um, because they may or may not be available on the website because they're kind of coming and going a little bit. I'm noticing now that whenever a new Retro 51 pen comes out, um, if it's a regularly offered pen, it may come in. You know, we're usually getting shorted on stock because everybody wants it. And then it sells out and then it kind of comes in and comes in in waves. Uh, that's kind of how it's going. So uh, I'm going to show you some stuff. It may or may not be available at the moment, but kind of keep checking back. You can sign up for an email list if you're interested. But um, first one is uh, Chopino. And I did talk about this in right now, so I won't go into super in-depth. But it is an abalone shell, basically like a rodden uh, pen. And it looks just incredible. And you can see in the video there. It just looks so much better than even the pictures can make it look. And it's very, very legit looking with rose gold trim and all that. And it's a more expensive pen. MSRP is 100 on this pen, but, um, you know, that's, that's on the higher end for retro. But, man, it's a sweet looking pen and one of the most affordable rotten pens that you can get. Uh, another one that we've got here is the Dino Fossil. Uh, and this is one that actually was done in collaboration with the Smithsonian. So it's part of the Smithsonian collection. Um, and this, from what I understand, is actually modeled after um, some of the actual dinosaur skeletons that they have in the Museum of Natural History. So pretty cool. And this is an acid etched pen. So it's got like a strong texture to it. And the color and everything just looks really just pops on this pen. So pens like this that have that acid etching, when you hold them, it just feels really cool in the hand. So that's a pretty sweet pen. And these are numbered, uh, but the numbering is not like a limited edition kind of thing. They're just numbering them kind of ongoing. So every pen gets a number, but it's not doesn't mean that it's going to stop. Um, and then the other pen that we have is the Vega. Uh, this is modeled after uh, Amelia Earhart's plane that they have. It's the Vega B5, I think it was called. Uh, and they have this plane in the Smithsonian in the... Uh, Air and Space Museum and then so they designed the pen to be kind of modeled after the airplane So that's pretty cool and it's uh, another acid etch one that's got the rivets and uh, the panel So it kind of looks like you know airplane panels on here pretty cool If you have like the p51 Mustang or anything like that that the, where it's kind of modeled after a plane It's got that same kind of vibe So that's pretty sweet some new pens coming from retro and we're gonna have more stuff in the works here this fall It's gonna be a lot of fun uh, what else we got? Uh, we have restock and expansion of the Clairefontaine Aquarelle, which I talked about in Q&A Q like several months ago. Um, but then I think they were all sold out by the time Q&A published. So it was such a tease. Um, basically, the way that this worked out, um, so we worked it out with Clairefontaine. They had like a stock of some of these that were left. That's what we bought last time. Uh, and they were so popular, they sold out so fast. We were like, 
maybe we should just have them do a full run of them. And there's very high minimums that we have to do to buy them, but we're just kind of taking a gamble and saying, okay, we hope that a lot of people really want it. So we have an A5 size wire bound uh, in graph. We have an A5 size lined, and then we have an A6 size lined as well. Um, so you can go and check those out. We have them. They should be exclusive to us in the US because we did an entire production run and bought them all. Um, so we may have them. I know we're getting questions about expanding the line, super high minimums. I don't know that we'll expand the line beyond where we're at here, but um, you know, you can go ahead and ask. <laughs> Just don't get, your, don't get your hopes dashed if we're not able to do it. Uh, other thing we got is the Aurora Optima Red Flex. So this is gonna be the last of the Aurora Optima Flexes that are gonna be coming red is the last color. We only have a handful of them, so they're gonna kinda come and go, but if you're interested in one, I would jump on it because it's gonna be the last and they're not gonna be around for long. Um, another pen that I've got here is the Visconti Ocean Breeze. So very cool pen. I was kind of surprised by this one. I mean, it's a nice looking pen. I thought it would be popular, but the one that is in the rose gold came and went. I mean, we didn't have a lot of them. I think they only made 48 of them worldwide uh, or something like that. Uh, and uh, the rest of them are the palladium trim, uh, but the rose gold are gone. Like we got our shipment in, we only got a few of them, they're gone and from what you hear, they're, they're out. So if you want a rose gold one, go find it anywhere you can and buy it immediately you know, because we don't have any more. And from what I understand, we can't get more. So that's kind of a bummer. But uh, if you're interested in, uh, it's a pretty sweet pen. So it's uh, kind of similar in style to, I'm trying to think of what is similar in style to the, um, oh gosh, what was the name of it? Uh, oh gosh, Northern Lights, may, oh shoot, I can't remember what it was called. Um, but anyway, so it's, it's a slightly different style. It's not quite like a Homo sapiens, um, but it's got a metal grip. It's got the hook safe lock, which is cool um, because normally pens that are kind of this shape would have a thread, um, like just a regular screw thread, but this has got the hook safe, which I love. Uh, full size palladium nib on it, which I love as well. Um, demonstrator pen, so you get to see everything that's going on there with this nice ribbon. It's a blue, kind of a light blue translucent kind of material. Uh, and then it's got the ribbons kind of on top of that. So very attractive looking pen. And then it's got this kind of wavy pattern engraved on the uh, center band and up at the top and the finial and all that. Um, very cool. And it's a double reservoir power filler as well. Just like, you know, the, the Opera Master and some of the higher end Viscontis that you would see. So very cool pen. It's uh, on the upper end of the price range, closer to the $1,000 uh, MSRP. Uh, price range, so it, it's it's not cheap, but it is really, really pretty cool. So that's the latest from Visconti. And then uh, I did want to give you a little bit of a heads up. The Montegrappa Rossi Cilegia Elmo is probably going to be gone by the time Q&A goes on Friday. Um, as I checked as of like Tuesday night, we had three left. And uh, so it's probably going to be gone, but um, you know, it's a, it's a nice pen. It was an exclusive one that we worked with them and it's, uh, it's putting that specific pen to rest is cool and I've got it uh, featured up here in the latest in the video. But uh, if we do happen to have any left on Friday, you better jump on it immediately because we're not making more. And then uh, coming soon stuff. So the Pilot Vanishing Point crossed lines. We're still waiting on that. Um, don't have any specific notice as to when we're getting it, but it's kind of like any day that could arrive. So that's pretty cool. That's the limited edition that Pilot comes out with every year for the Vanishing Point. It's just black with white lines on it, kind of styled fancily, I guess. The lines don't particularly represent anything. It's just a, it's just a um, um, aesthetic, uh, you know, design thing. Um, we're also going to be getting in a Diplomat Arrow in the new blue color. Um, I think we're going to have just a little bit of a jump on that one. So we're getting it just a, just a little bit in advance. It's not like an exclusive to us, but um, maybe just a, a brief time exclusive, if you will, maybe like 30 days max. So um, we'll get a little bit of a jump on it. And so we'll have some available um, and then you'll be able to get it at pretty much whatever retail you want that carries Diplomat. Um, and uh, the Arrow is like just quickly become one of my favorite pens. I've always appreciated that pen a lot, but it's pretty cool. And the blue color is like, bow, pops. It's a little brighter blue than like the Goulet blue. It's more of like a sky blue, but it looks pretty rad, especially in that anodized finish. Mm. I don't have it with me to show you because I haven't gotten a sample in yet, but we'll have it by next week. 
And then uh, online is a new brand that we are going to be carrying, um, the Switch Plus and the Slope. It's a more affordable pen line. We're trying to trying to get some more affordable pens in there, but they are made in Germany uh, and they use Yobo nibs uh, and uh, Yobo and Bach. I think some of them are a mix of Bach and Yovo, depending on the pen. You know, when you get to a less expensive pen like that, I think you have to get less picky. Um, but uh, most of the pens, I think, are gonna be Yovo. So that's pretty cool. Both respectable pen brands, and, and they write well. I've written with some samples of them and stuff like that. And um, They've actually been around for, uh, the Switch Plus has been around for a long time, actually. The Slope is, is relatively new, and I think the Slope is the one that's gonna have the mix uh, of nibs, but they're gonna write pretty similarly. I tried kind of both, I couldn't tell the difference. So it's pretty cool. All right, that's what we got for this week. As far as new stuff that's coming in, uh, let's go ahead and get into the questions, shall we? First one I have is a pen and writing question from Jillian B. Gillian. Gillian? Jillian? Starts with a G. I don't really know how to pronounce it, so forgive me if I pronounce it wrong. Uh, if different pen companies use both the same third-party nib, for example, a Yovo number no. 6, how much is it customized for the particular pen brand? And is that done by Yovo or the pen company or the distributor or double question mark? <laughs> how much and what types of variation are possible or common? Okay, so the short answer on this is it depends. Um, I'm not really privy to the specific details of how every pen manufacturer you know, has their specifications with a third party uh, nib manufacturer um, and kind of how they how they buy from it. So um, it's likely that the nib manufacturer, whoever it is, um, is probably not doing anything different with the kind of stock unbranded nibs, if you will. So the way that most of these companies are operating is they make, you know, kind of like a, a standard nib that's unbranded and it's just kind of got like a generic pattern on it. Um, for Yovo, you might see where it's got just kind of like the little squigglies on it. Like if you look at the Goulet nibs, it's got this like little filigree type thing. Um, and then we've got our logo in the middle. If you don't engrave our logo in it, it's just got that little design stuff on the outside and, and that's what their standard nib looks like. Um, so they'll come out with their standard nib. They might sell it, you know, to whomever in whatever quantities they want to. Um, but if you are kind of the, you know, the big timer manufacturer, you might, you know, might either engrave your logo in it like we do, it's a laser engraving, or if you have a stamped logo, um, like for example, um, you know, Diplomat and um, Monograppa, they've got a stamped logo on there. Um, so the difference there is like our nibs, Edison nibs, um, you know, Franklin Kristoff, all those brands using a Yovo nib, it's, it's sort of a standard nib and then it's laser engraved, which allows you to basically do it in smaller quantities than you would if you had a stamping. Because when you stamp it, you have to get a die press and you have to get it all custom done and buy in large quantities and stuff. So it's usually only like, large full-scale manufacturers that are doing the stamped stuff because um, it's a significant investment. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's really mostly an aesthetic thing too. So, but the stamping allows you to actually um, have that, that logo or design imprinted into the metal itself. It's not just like engraved into the plating. It's like it's in there and then it's plated after that. So, um, you know, it just can look a little It'll look a little different, look a little cleaner maybe um, if it's stamped, um, and that's kind of like that's kind of like the dream, right? Is to be big enough to have your nibs stamped. So, uh, but anyway, when you're dealing with kind of the stock nibs like that, whether it's an unbranded or maybe like a laser engraved type thing, it's probably going to more or less be standard coming from the nib manufacturer. Again, I'm I'm speculating. I can't speak to how everybody has it done, um, but probably it's not going to be specified in terms of like, you know, we want it to have an X degree of toothiness and a six out of 10 flow instead of a seven out of 10 flow, it's probably not gonna be that specific. Now with a major manufacturer, can they can they achieve that? Like pro probably, um, but I don't know. I don't have specific knowledge of a company that works with a third party nib manufacturer that specifically has their nibs either ground a certain way or adjusted for flow in a certain way that is specifically different. It's very possible. I just don't know if that's the case. I would think that, you know, for economies of scale, it would make sense for whoever the nib manufacturer would be to do those adjustments and things. And then the manufacturer of the pens doesn't necessarily have to, but I think probably more likely what happens, the nib manufacturer makes their nibs to a certain standard. If you want to deviate from how they're doing the nibs, 
I mean, if you're large enough, maybe you can influence how they would do their process, but probably you're gonna be buying the nibs from them and then any adjustments that you would have as a pen manufacturer or like us, we're buying a supply of these nibs. If we want it to be different than how it's coming to us, we need to make those adjustments, right? Um, so as a retailer, as a manufacturer, as a distributor, um, it really could happen in any of those places. I think probably what you're more likely to see is much more of a standard uh, kind of offering coming from the manufacturer because they got to crank these things out. It's going to make much more sense for them to make them to a really good standard, but have it be more or less consistent coming from the manufacturer. And then as it goes out to the individual companies, the companies based on whether it's the manufacturer or, you know, retailers or distributors to be able to kind of make tweaks and adjustments to them based on their specific market in whatever area they are. Or with the manufacturer, you know, if they really want to be known for having a wet writing pen for some reason, um, they would adjust all their nibs to be wetter writing, maybe. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think generally people want you know, good, reliable, consistent, good flowing, you know, kind of stuff. I think like a seven out of 10 flow, medium amount of toothiness, probably the feel of the nib on the paper is, is where you're gonna get a little more variation than you would flow. Um, because flow, you just want it to be consistent. If it's too much flow, then it's a problem. If it's not enough flow, it dries out. So really getting kind of that sweet spot that like seven out of 10 flow is gonna be probably how most of your nibs uh, would come from the factories consistently. Um, but then, you know, if you're looking at uh, uh, nib smoothness, now that is probably gonna be done to a different standard um, from most manufacturers and different people. Like we, we, we get our nibs in and we monkey with them a little bit. We have some sort of the ways that we like to do things. So we played around with a lot of the nibs as they've come in and there's certain nibs, certain nib sizes where we're like, yep, they do this just the way we like them. So we don't really need to mess with them. We kind of inspect them and check them and stuff like that, but we're not really changing them the way they're coming to us. Other ones we're like, yeah, we, we would really prefer if this nib would feel this way. So we make all those, all those adjustments for certain things. I'm not gonna say which ones we do because that's proprietary, but um, I will say that, there, that as a supplier, if you will, of a certain branded nib product, um, that's what we've done is we've kind of taken our own personal preferences and done our adjustments to it, but we are not large enough, I guess, to dictate to Yovo how we want them to come to us. We, I mean, yes, to a degree, we, you know, it's gotta be consistent and look the branding and, and it's gotta be a certain quality, but as far as like an exact amount of nib smoothness and stuff like that, like we're just not able to dictate that to them. Maybe once we're, you know, a hundred times as big as we are, we could, but um, we're making those adjustments ourselves because it's really our own, our own kind of preference here. All right, I went way off my notes on this one. Let me make sure I covered everything that I wanted to. Um, okay, so I had an example in here on my notes. So, um, you know, thinking about like Bach as an example. Um, you know, like Monteverde and Conklin now, like we've arranged for some Bach nibs to be on their pens, um, but like Bach also is on Keras Customs, for example. Um, so, you know, Keras Customs has, you know, just kind of the standard Bach nib. They don't have a Keras Customs branded thing on here. We got the same kind of situation going. And so even though like Keras Customs and and you know, Monteverde have nothing to do with each other per se, you know, they're getting kind of a stock nib supply from, uh, from Bach and then they're each putting it on there. Keras Customs may be doing something and kind of monkeying with the nibs. You know, Yaffa may be monkeying with the Monteverde uh, Bach nibs. And uh, so there could be a slight difference in writing experience from those two. Um, but largely, I don't think it's that Bach is like supplying a greatly different product. Again, speculation, but that's kind of how I think it works. Um, let's see here. So you asked how much and what types of variation are possible or common. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, you're not getting any serious modifications or differences from most manufacturers unless they're like whole different nib sizes or they're doing some, some pretty serious modifications or grinds or things like that. Um, you know, you may get some of that more at the retailer level. Like I don't really know any distributors uh, or manufacturers that are kind of getting a third nib supplier to, to do their nibs and then they're like doing serious grinding on them per se. Um, you know, you're gonna get some, like for example, I just talked about uh, Monteverde uh, and Keras Customs using uh, Bach, um, but also like Penider uh, on their 
uh, La Grande Balitza, uh, worked with Bach. They designed this nib, though. So this is Bach is making this nib for them, but Dante Del Vecchio designed this nib. Uh, and so it's a unique nib that they're getting, uh, and they're probably doing some of their own adjustments to it, but Bach is supplying that nib to them that's a really kind of a special and unique thing. So that right there might be an example, or for example, like um, there's titanium nibs you can get or from Bach. And then uh, Visconti, for example, uses their palladium nibs. That's something they developed with Bach. And so that's a unique thing they have. So just it, just because it's coming from the manufacturer doesn't mean it's gonna all be exactly the same, but you're gonna have to get a pretty serious investment and commitment to have something unique uh, and different like that from a third party manufacturer. And then you make your own adjustments as you see fit. Um, and then at the kind of retailer level, you know, there are some retailers, uh, very, very few, but there are some that will do nib adjustments and grinds and things like that. Um, a lot of times you see that from like an, an even third party, like nib meister, if you will, who just purely focuses on nib modifications and stuff. Um, you know, think about like the Mike Masayamas and Mark Bacchus and people like that. Um, you'll get a select few other retailers, I'm thinking specifically John Modishaw, you know, with nibs.com, um, and then uh, nib, nib, uh, nib Smith, Dan Smith, you know, who's a retailer and has, has pens that they offer and then they'll do custom grinds on it. Uh, you know, and for me, that, that's, that's very interesting and I've been asked about that for years and that's kind of like the dream for me. It's difficult for us at the scale that we are to implement something like that, but you know, long-term, yeah, that would be, that would be great. So uh, to do something like that. So then you'll see, you'll see more modifications and stuff like that coming down, I think, more at the kind of the retailer level. Um, it gets interesting when you get to that place because then basically you're doing something different to the pen than the manufacturer intended. So you're kind of taking the nib warranty into your own hands as a, as a retailer when you do that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, that's just something to, 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 to be aware of. Um, and you just deal direct with, directly with that retailer and whoever, whoever did that modification when you have a warranty issue with that nib. Um, but uh, it's a lot of work. Like nib work is a lot of work. So um, it takes a lot of time. And so at the like manufacturer level, they're gonna do you know, what they need to to get it done, but they're not gonna offer like all these crazy custom grinds and stuff like that because this is not probably practical for them. Um, so you're gonna see some of that at the retailer level, mainly because it's like a value add or maybe a competitive differentiator um, for them, um, but it's very difficult to do at scale. So long and short of it, it's really most efficient to get any nib work or modifications done kind of as close to the manufacturer as possible, but the farther down the distribution chain you go, you'll probably find more potential modifications occurring, and it can really happen kind of anywhere in the process. So it's, it's really fascinating as I've been in the business to learn kind of how things go at different stages, um, you know, but uh, that's that's more or less kind of how it ends up shaking out. And then the cool thing is if you ever, you know, whoever you're buying from, uh, you can always ask them kind of what's going on with it. And, and uh, most people in the fountain pen industry are pretty knowledgeable about how stuff goes, or at least they should be pretty knowledgeable. So um, uh, you can always uh, kind of find out if you're interested, you know, what pen is different from any other and where did the nib come from and who's messed with it and that kind of thing. Um, you can always kind of ask and, and hopefully get some answers on it. All right. Next question I have is from J. Francis Imagery on Instagram. Should a pen always write under its own weight or is that an unreasonable expectation? That's a really good question. Um, so ideally, yes, a pen should be able to write under its own weight. Um, just to give you an example here, uh, what, am I, what have I got in my pocket? Oh, I've got a, um, let me see here, I got a Twisby Go inked up. Um, so that'll, that'll be a good example. So I've got a little piece of paper. Um, so the way that fountain pens work is you've got uh, capillary action that's kind of the running driving force behind all of this. You got ink, which is mostly made of water in a constricted kind of channel that runs all the way through the pen and that capillary action draws it through. And if a pen is properly tuned, there should be the right amount of kind of an opening for the ink to be able to flow through. And then it should end up where the end of the nib is these tines uh, that, that join right at the tip there's a little bit of a slit for an ink channel, and as soon as you touch it down to the page, that ink should be right there at the paper. And just by the just by making that contact there, the capillary action should draw the ink out of the pen. You shouldn't have to, it, it's not gravity that pushes it down. You shouldn't have to press on it and force it out. It should really just go. So, you know, for example, I have this Twisby, and um, if I just kind of take and, 
you know, just like this with my fingers, um, you can see there that, you know, I've got a nice line. So it's kind of hard to do this at an angle where you can really see it, but <laughs> I can't even make sure I'm holding the pen right. Okay, but if I hold it right, I just drag it across like that. And you see there, I've got a couple lines on the page. So um, that's that's one test that you can do when you're messing around with nibs to see if it's if it's really flowing well and all that kind of stuff is it'll write under its own weight. Um, what often you'll find um, when you're messing around with different pens is uh, it may not it may not actually do that. Um, oftentimes you'll find you need to put a little bit of writing pressure on it. Now this is where it's up for debate a little bit. In a perfect world. <laughs> Just like in a perfect world, if you're, if you're uh, maintaining your, your car, if you're driving your car, you should always change your oil every X number of miles. It used to be 3,000, but now I think most cars are longer than that. Um, and then there's synthetic oil and all that kind of stuff. So maybe that example doesn't hold up as well. But you should always rotate your tires a certain amount and clean your oil a certain amount and all that kind of stuff. Um, same kind of thing with fountain pens. Like in a perfect world, Everybody should hold their pen angle at such and such, and you shouldn't write with a lot of pressure. It should just be able to write and flow and all that kind of stuff. But in, in practicality, uh, that doesn't always happen. So I think what actually happens a lot of times is manufacturers uh, kind of know how the general population writes, and they actually kind of account for that a little bit. Uh, most people write with too much pressure. Uh, and if you have a properly tuned pen, yes, you can uh, you can tune it really properly and stuff like that, and then, um, and then you can you can uh, you know of course write with it as normal and stuff. But um, the most manufacturers actually end up over polishing their nibs just a little bit, um, and sometimes it's intentionally, sometimes that's just kind of the way they do it. Um, but the reason is because they want the nib to feel smooth on the paper, because a scratchy nib is like one of the most offensive things. If it flows well but it feels scratchy, that's like a deal breaker for people. If it feels really, really good and flow breaks every now and then, that's usually a deal breaker. It's kind of frustrating for a lot of people, but not as much as necessarily as like the scratchy feeling on the paper. So if you have a nicely tuned nib and you're pressing too hard, you can make that pen feel scratchy. Whereas if you polish it up a little bit more, um, it, it can take more of that pressure and uh, it will still feel smooth if you're writing really hard. Um, you know, but the challenge is if you, if you over polish it like that, what happens if you're staring right at the tip of the nib, right? And um, you want just a little bit of a slit here. If you press too hard, you're like digging that corner in. So what happens is manufacturers polish the inside of the tip of that nib uh, to be smooth. And if they over polish that a little bit, it creates what's called baby's bottom um, because it looks like a, a butt. Okay, <laughs> that, that right there, the slit, you know, is right there. And then it's polished too much and it kind of breaks the capillary action. So what happens is you press on it, it widens the channel a little bit, causes more ink to flow through and then it writes just fine. So it's almost like if you over polish it, you're, it's gonna be better for people that write with a harder hand, but you almost need to write with a harder hand for it to write better kind of thing. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what you see happening with, with a lot of different pen manufacturers. Um, and it's, it's not uber, uber consistent across the entire pen industry. So um, to answer your question, I don't think that it's an unrealistic expectation. I think that's kind of the goal. Um, and if you talk to any Nibmeister, they're gonna say, yep, over polishing happens all the time. Um, but uh, pro with proper tuning and, and basically if you have, if you have kind of that baby's bottom effect, the, really the remedy for that is to, is to sand it away and round, round it back out. and and then do it properly. So it's, it's a bit of work and you have to kind of know the technique of what you're doing. It's, it's, not, it's not impossible and you don't even need special tools uh, really to do it. Uh, micro mesh, honestly, is, is kind of all you need if it's not too bad. You know, something a little harder, a little harder sandpaper uh, could get it done. I'm not gonna get all into that today. Um, but, uh, you know, every Nibmeister that I know really aims to, to get rid of that and to make, you know, a nicely smoothly writing pen that'll write under its own weight. That's that's really the goal, and, and in a perfect world, every pen that is manufactured in the entire world would be like that. Um, but you know, over polishing is not something completely crazy, uh, and it happens kind of across a lot of different brands, across a lot of different price points too, even. So um, something that I'm trying to do, having some more of this nib knowledge and having talked to different nib meisters and stuff with a lot of experience, I'm trying to talk to more manufacturers and let them know like, Hey, 
here's where you guys should make some adjustments if you're open to that feedback. You know, I'm trying to look at a lot of different nibs and see where there's examples of overpolishing and stuff and giving that feedback to them. A lot of times they're open to that, sometimes they're not. Um, but that is something I am trying to do. So um, we're always on the listen around here about you all when you're having uh, flow issues and, and stuff like that um, to be on the lookout for that. But um, yeah, hope that answers the question for you. Next question I have is from Kellen Winfield on Instagram. Why can't I find a replacement lib nib? Mm, why can't I find a replacement nib for my Lamy 2000? Okay, get asked this a lot, but the short answer is because there is no replacement nib for it. So you can't find it because you, they don't exist. Um, I don't think that Lamy's ever done a replacement nib for Lamy 2000, not that I'm aware. Uh, and I was in talks with them about maybe trying to offer that last year and it kind of broke down. And so it's not something they've ever done. I think they're really hesitant to even do it. And now we're having supply issues getting Lamy 2000s at all. So I don't anticipate any time in the near future that it's gonna be a possibility. I'm just taking the pen apart and I'm not even talking you through it, but uh, I'll show you kind of how this pen breaks down so you get an idea of, of what a spare nib even is for this pen. It's not the same as the Lamy's other Lamy pens where you can just like slide the nib off and that's, it's, you just keep on going. So you unscrew the pen here. Uh, right at the, you know, behind the grip here. You almost can't even see the seam because they're manufactured so tightly. Um, and then it's got this little, uh, this little ring on here which can easily pop out and you can lose that. So right off the bat there, if you're changing this at your sink and you just go nuts and you lose this thing down your sink, you're not gonna be able to cap your pen again. So that right there is like, yikes. You gotta really know what you're getting into if you're doing that. Um, so. You know, it can be done, it's, it can be unscrewed, but Lamy's like really hesitant to just like, oh yeah, change your nib all the time, because they know people are gonna lose that little ring. Um, and then just give a little bit of push here on the nib uh, with, with some care, <laughs> uh, and then you pull it out, and then this is your nib unit in here, right? So it's the nib just attached to the feed. It is not easy to remove this nib off the feed. Um, not as easy as it is to remove the nib off of the steel, uh, the steel nibs off the feeds. Um, but this is it. So you can't pull it out when it's installed in the pen. If you pull it off, you could lose parts. Um, it's not really easy to swap. So pretty much you'd have to, uh, it's really challenging. So when I was talking to them before, trying to, trying to make it happen, basically they would only supply the nib, not the feed. So you would have to disassemble the whole pen, take it off, remove this thing safely, and then slide that other nib on here, and then reinstall it back into the pen, which has to be in a very specific orientation because the hooded nib has like this kind of half moon shape. And if you just go jamming this thing in here, you could put it in the wrong way and damage your feed and cram your nib into the side of the pen. In fact, I need to make sure I really line it up. There we go. There's a channel on the bottom of the feed that lines up to this notch that's in the bottom of the grip of the pen. And then you slide it back in there. So, you know, and then you just screw it back together. So it can be done, but it's, you're kind of hacking it pretty good. And Lamy's like, we don't really know how this would work and then the supply of them and how do we ship them and all this kind of stuff. Um, plus when they quoted me out a price on them, it was, you know, I didn't get a firm price on it, but I was told it might be in like the $125 range by the time it reached retail. So it's like, all right, the whole pen street price is like 160. So would you really pay 125 just for the nib when you can get the whole new pen for 160? Some people probably would, but so it was like, we're jumping through hoops, trying to pull teeth, have to do all this instruction and people taking liability of swapping the nibs themselves and you're paying a premium. Does that really make sense? I don't know. Yeah, in a perfect world, you'd be like, yeah, I'd love another nib for like 30 bucks <laughs> and I could just swap it out. But you know, it's just not the thing. So, you know, again, I don't think that's probably going to happen, but if you guys are all really like, yeah, I, if knowing all this, I still really, really want this. Let me know in the comments and I'll pass that feedback along. Um, and, and see if maybe that's anything they're open to in the future, but absolutely no promises. And um, yeah, that's just kind of where we're at. Next question is from the aspiring penman on Instagram. Are you able to switch the nibs of the Monte Grappa Elmo or the Peniter Avatar with other number six sized nibs? What about the nib unit? Is it interchangeable with other nib units? Thanks. Okay, very nib heavy question today. And I got another one after this too. All right, so Monograppa Elmo. So this one is, uh, 
you know, now no longer available, basically, but, uh, you know, we've got it. Um, but it uses a standard number six size nib. So um, it's actually the exact same size nib unit. It's made by Yovo. Um, you could actually just unscrew this thing and swap it right onto uh, another pen that also takes, you know, Edison. So um, when you're, whenever you're removing a nib unit, you always want to take the converter out. You know, this one's got a threaded converter. So you just unscrew that because that converter is going to like grab onto the back. And so it's going to make it harder to unscrew. So you always take the converter off. And then when you're moving the nib unit, you never want to touch the tip. You just want to grab at the base. And then uh, it actually lets go pretty easily on this particular pen. And you can see here, ta-da, there's the whole nib unit. Uh, so I'm going to take that one apart. And then I'm also going to take Edison because I have an Edison pen. And this one is going to be the same deal because it's also supplied from Yovo. Take the converter off, grab the base of the nib, take it off, ta-da. And if you notice, looking at the housings and stuff, it's gonna be identical. The nibs themselves, you know, are gonna be a little different. The pattern's different. This is an Edison Flex nib. Um, but the base and the housing and everything is going to be identical. So basically, if I wanna take this Edison Flex nib and throw it over on my monograppa, basically screw it in here, ta-da. Take the converter, screw it back in, Put it back in the pen. Voila, I now have a flex nib on my monograppa. Likewise, if I want to take the monograppa nib, drop it all over the place, and then screw it into my Edison, I can do so. Now, it only works that way if you have the exact same housing from one pen to the other. And of course, this is not something that we like are given any information on. No manufacturer is advertising what other brands' pens their nibs can swap onto. Um, because they don't want that kind of liability and any brand could change it at any time. So they just say, here's what we have. Um, so we try to go deep when we can and say, okay, you can swap this and that, but it's the information may change and one pen to another might end up being different. So it's always going to be in like hack status, right? Um, so for us, it's really like you got to try. And so this is where it gets deep into like you know, a good place for this is like in the Q&A section on our product pages. Um, that usually ends up working out really well uh, with, um, you know, being able to ask these types of, of very specific questions. Um, and then others can benefit from it too when it's on our product pages. So um, there's that part of it, the whole nib unit thing. But, you know, you asked about the um, Paniter, right? The Avatar, which in fact, I do not have an Avatar. I have a Lagrande Valetza, but still number six size nib, so we'll try it on both. Now, Bach, different company from Germany, is making the nibs for this pen. So again, I'll take this one apart, unscrew that. Um, and this one also comes in a housing. This one, this housing is a little tighter in here, so you got to really be careful. And the nib is a little more fragile because just the way you can see the design on the Paniter nib, um, you know, it's got, it's made to have a little bit of give on it to be a little bit flexy. Um, so they, they weaken it by kind of cutting these out here a little bit. So you just want to be careful when you're removing it and whatnot. Um, let's see here. So I unscrew it and pull it out. And then where it's going to get complicated is in the housing part. So now I've got a Monograppa Elmo nib and I've got a Paniter nib. And I don't know how much you can see this. I will try to get it here, yeah. But the housing is gonna be different. The thread padding is different. The size of the housing is slightly different. So if I try to screw one of these nibs into the other, it is just not going to work. It's just not gonna work. I'm not even gonna really, bot I'm not even gonna really try hard because you know, it'll like generally slide in, but the thread pattern is not going to work. Like it's just spinning there. It's not going to grab onto it. And so it's just, it's just not going to work. Sorry, I am on a text chain right now and my phone is blowing up in my pocket. <laughs> it's very distracting to me. Uh, anyway, so what I've got going on here is I cannot swap the nib housings in between these pens. I really can't even like advertise on the site which nib housings can swap on which other pens. That's why I take weird Q&A questions like this, very specific ones. Um, but however, for certain nibs like number six nibs like this, you can, if you really want to go into the, to the deep end here, you can swap some of these nibs and I'm going to get into some crazy swapping territory here. First off, let me take the Edison nib 
off of my monograppa. So I've got my monograppa here. I already took the nib unit out. So I'm actually going to reinstall the nib unit. Um, so I've already determined that I cannot swap the nib. I'm going to install the body of the pen back on. It's just going to make it easier to hold. So I cannot swap the nib unit in between the two. However, if I'm really dedicated <laughs> to this process and I am willing to take my nib's life into my own hands, uh, which I am in this instance because I'm doing it for the greater good, I can actually yank the nib out of the pen and swap it that way. So um, the way that I like to do it, you know, you can use a rubber grip. Um, I'm, I've done enough of it where I can just use my fingers. Um, I like to do it where I have the pen in my hand like this. I take my thumb and kind of have it on the back of the feed and I wrap my uh, pointer finger around here. I know people that do it different ways. Really, you can do it however you want. This is just kind of the way that I do it because it just kind of nestles right in the crux of my finger there. I don't know if that's the right, in the, in the nook of my finger. And I can um, just press it together a little bit. I'm not touching the tip of the nib. Press it together and then, and then just kind of hold it there. And then I slowly pull the body of the pen away. And sometimes you have to work the nib back and forth just a little bit. Um, if you, the thing you don't want to do is go like this and yank because then what might happen, I'll show you, you can bend the nib, you can bend the fins on the feed, or oftentimes what happens is you have this little tiny like piece on the end. This is what goes up through the very um, tip of the, the housing in the back here to help with the capillary action. You can snap that thing off pretty easily, especially if you're just yanking like this and you go, you can snap that little piece off. It'll still work okay, but you just don't wanna go breaking your nib, breaking your feet if you don't have to. Anyway, so now I've very delicately, you know, pulled the nib out of my pen. And, you know, it's just friction fit in there, so you can easily separate the nib and the feed. Um, it's usually best to try to keep the feed in the pen that it came from, just because the feed usually matches up to the housing that it's in. Um, and uh, so for fitting purposes, it'll work a little bit better there. Usually the feed is kind of made to fit the nib, and the housing to get like together. So, you know, flow wise, it would, it would probably be more ideal to keep the feed with it, but you know, sometimes the feeds just aren't exactly the right shape for the other housing. And so I usually try to keep the feed with it if you're, if you're swapping just the metal nib. Um, and then basically I'm gonna do the same thing with the Peniter. Uh, and so I just kind of yank that out, pull it out like so. And like this feed is a very different configuration. So I'm just gonna leave that one there. And I'm gonna take this and I'm going to put this feed on, or sorry, put this nib onto the feed, and then I'm gonna put it into my Montegrappa. Let's see if I can fit this thing in here. Ta-da! I don't know how either of these companies would feel about me doing this, um, but there you go. I now have a Peniter nib on my Montegrappa Elmo. And uh, just for kicks and giggles, I gotta make sure I don't lose any of my pieces here. <laughs> Just for kicks and giggles, uh, I'm gonna take my Jinhao Shimmering Sands, which is also a number six, which is not made by Bach or Yovo, uh, and I'm going to yank the nib out of this one, and I'm gonna put my Peniter nib on here. <laughs> so I'm gonna take a nib from a $500 MSRP pen and put it on a $10 pen. So just kind of put it in there gently. So now I've got the Jinhao feed on there. Voila, now I have a Peniter nib <laughs> on my Jinhao Shimmering Sands. Why not, right? Totally impractical, you know. They do not sell these nibs separately, so you would have to buy a really, really nice pen and put it onto your Jinhao, and then what would you do? Put your Jinhao nib on your Peniter? Um, you know, not super practical probably, but that's not what I was going for here. I was just trying to give you the possibilities, not the practicalities. So that's how that process works. Um, did I answer your question? It's really... <laughs> Um, the truth is, uh, with the nib units, some of the pens you can swap nib units. Um, you're much more limited there. It's it's much easier because you're not having to yank pen parts apart from each other. And by the way, like the nib and feed has to fit in a very specific orientation too. So you're in like deep hacker territory here. Um, I have my converter in here. Okay. So yeah, don't do that unless you're really ready to kind of take your pen's life into your own hands. Um, but you can start having some real fun Franken-penning your stuff if you are so inclined. And by the way, you didn't hear from the manufacturers uh, if they ask uh, that I told you to do this. I'm just letting you know 
that it can be done. Okay, but you're on your own. I'm not gonna not gonna back you up on this one if you screw something up. <laughs> All right, so that's that. Got my paniter back in good shape. And again, I've done this a lot, so I can do it and talk at the same time when I really can't even do much of any two things at the same time. This is how many times I've pulled nibs out of pens and such like that. So you can have a lot of fun, and I hope you have a blast. All right. Next question I have is from this, user, <laughs> this username is available on Instagram, which is funny because as soon as they created that avatar, it then, uh, of course, was not available. I often see videos, nib mods of popular pens like the Platinum 3776 and other pens saying, with added flexibility, and they will flex well than the stock ones. Exactly what is done to get a nib the added flexibility? Okay, I think the, there's one video in particular that's very, very popular that has a uh, uh, Pilot Falcon, uh, or Namiki Falcon, as it was made at the time, uh, that John Modishaw had added flexibility to, and it's got like 5 million views on YouTube. It's insane. Um, so I've been aware of this video for years. Um, and the thing is, you can add flex, um, but a lot of times that's done kind of aftermarket, right? Like the, the one that I'm specifically thinking of, which may not even be the one that you're talking about here, but it's probably one of the most popular videos I've seen, um, is, is an aftermarket modification, if you will. So it wasn't anything from the factory. It was done by a Nibmeister, um, you know, when the pen was sold. So um, there's a lot of different ways to add flex to a nib. Um, some of them require like actual design uh, into the nib when it's manufactured. So yeah, there's there's different ways that that can be achieved. Um, and that I won't really address as much because I don't think that's the nature of your question when you're talking about with added flexibility. Um, that's like a modification that's done after market, if you will. Um, so that's what I'm gonna focus on really in this question today. Um, so uh, let's see here. Let's assume that you have a nib and you want it to add flexibility to it. So you've already got your nib, there's no design changes per so to speak. Um, there's a couple different techniques. Uh, one that you can do is sort of like you have on the Noodler's pens. Um, you know, an example of that is where you basically just take and you cut a very deep slit down the middle. So most pens um, will have a nib slit that only goes about halfway to a breather hole and then it stops. If you want to add flexibility, you can cut a deeper slit and what that's going to do is that's going to essentially weaken each of the tines and allow the tines to bend a little bit. So if you've ever used a Noodler's Flex Pen, that's the basic principle of what you have going on there. Of course, you can get into the softness of the metal and all that kind of stuff, but I'm really talking about added modification. Essentially, the essence of what you're trying to do with any added flex modification is you're really trying to weaken the metal because when you're adding flexibility, you're eliminating strength. You're taking away strength. So you're trying to weaken the metal in, in, in some fashion. So you can cut that slit to make the tines a little more independent of each other. That's one way you can do it. You can thin the tines, um, like if you have any of the Aurora Flex nibs. Um, that's how they've done that. And there's a lot of times you can do um, this with different techniques. But if you look at the, the tines here, I'm going to hold it up to um, like an, a completely unmodified um, pen. This isn't really apples to apples because it's not Aurora to Aurora, but you have an Aurora flex nib next to a Yovo steel nib. And it's subtle, but the Aurora flex nib is a little pointier. Like you can see, it's a little, it's, it cuts into the wings just a little bit more. Um, and that, again, kind of weakens the metal a little bit, allows it to flex. You can do it too much <laughs> and then make it whew, flex and completely spring apart. Um, so there is a fine balance there, but that's essentially kind of uh, at least part of what's going on, and that's somewhat of a visual representation of, you know, taking material away from the tines, thinning out those tines. That's one way to do it. Another way you can do it is sort of what's done on the um, Yovo Flex nibs, like I have on this Edison, uh, as well as the Paniter here, um, where you're actually removing chunks of the material kind of out of the middle of it. So Paniter has it kind of down here. Paniter, again, also kind of taking a little bit off the side. Um, and then Yovo is very obvious because it's got like these big notches kind of cut out. Um, and you'll see that as a modification a lot of times on Reddit or people that are kind of messing around with nibs. They'll just take and they'll just like, cut these like big like jackknife kind of things in the side or they're like scoop out chunks of it the pilot um you know fa nib on the custom 912 if you've ever seen that that's kind of they've, like scooped it out and essentially all you're doing is removing material to again weaken it and allow for flexibility um and then the other thing that you can do which is much harder 
and as much less noticeable visually as you can actually remove the nib and you can kind of thin it this way, like top to bottom, like actually thin out the metal as opposed to like thinning it, you know, through the side or whatever, you can thin underneath and weaken the metal, thin it out that way. A lot of times that's done in conjunction with doing some other things uh, in order to add the flexibility. That takes a lot of talent, that takes a lot of skill and a lot of time to do it really well. Um, so that one is kind of like one of the more difficult ways to do it. Um, as relatively complex as fountain pens are, you know, adding flex is some of the most challenging work that there is. And a lot of nibmeisters who have a lot of experience may not even mess with adding flex because they just either don't want to focus on it or it's too easy to screw stuff up. Um, so it's very few people that will actually do that, um, which is part of why you don't see it like mass available. Even though you see the videos and stuff like that and you're like, ooh, dang, I want that. Where can I get that? It's like some of the hardest things to track down. So of course you figure everybody wants what they can't have, um, but that's at least in principle how adding flex uh, can be accomplished. Okay, I got like one chunk of battery left on my camera and I just, I'm like waiting for the camera to die any second. So if it does, uh, you'll see a blip in the video and you'll know that I've just changed the battery at that point. All right, uh, let's move on to a troubleshooting question, shall we? So this is from Sima P on Facebook. How does one do routine cleaning of the Boston safety pen? Noodler's Boston safety pen. I'm not talking about taking the whole thing apart for a deep cleaning after using a tough ink, just the routine cleaning and flushing that we'd normally do when changing inks, okay? And I'm glad you clarified because uh, you can completely disassemble this pen and I might just do that for fun because uh, after I answer your question because I just, it's fun to do. Um, so the Boston safety pen, you're like, what the heck is that? If you're not familiar. So a safety pen essentially um, is designed in such a way uh, so that while you're transporting it, it's not going to leak. Um, the nib is completely submerged down in the ink. Uh, and then with the Noodler's pen specifically here, the way it's designed, you can use um, like their Noodler safety ink or a thicker ink, uh, India ink and stuff like that. So it's really made kind of for artists. Um, who want to use some pretty gnarly inks that normally would ruin a fountain pen. But in a safety pen, it's okay because it's completely made of ebonite and it is, is submerged in the ink while you're using it uh, or while you're carrying it around. Uh, and the way that this works is the pen has threads right at the grip here and it threads into the top of the cap. So basically it's, it seals off the entire inside of the pen with the nib submerged in the ink so that when you carry it around, it's safe to carry around. Um, now the ironic part of it is if you have the ink, uh, the pen filled with ink and the nib is not up, you have it like this and so you open it like that, all of the ink dumps out of the pen. So safety is somewhat of a misnomer. You have to kind of know what you're getting into with the safety pen. Um, but that's how they work. It's a design from like the early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, not at common at all today, but uh, you know, Nathan Tardif, he's a trendsetter. So he's developed this pen. It's actually a pretty ingenious design. I got a mad respect for the guy um, for developing this thing, but it's it's a pretty, pretty fascinating little pen, a little interesting piece of pen history. Oh, my battery's giving me the you're about to die signal. Let me stop the battery and change it out. And we're back. Thank you, Andy, for giving me a second battery because I ended up needing it. All right, so where was I? Talking about the safety pen. So yes, so the pen is a little bit different because, you know, there's no there's no filling mechanism, so to speak. Um, unless you disassemble the pen, there's no like easy way to, to flush it out really. Um, so if you're going for a thorough deep cleaning, completely disassembling the pen is gonna be about your only option. But assuming you're like, all right, I have an ink, I wanna change it out, the color's close enough, it's not anything too wild. Um, I think probably the best method that you're going to have for cleaning this thing out is going to be, you know, to, to have the, the nib down inside the pen and then kind of like shake all the ink out if there's any excess. You know, you can kind of like work the nib back and forth just to get any excess ink. Then uh, when, you have the, when you have the pen, the way this thing works, when you have the pen pushed up so the nib is exposed, um, it, it has a little pressure right here, so it kind of keeps the ink contained in the back of the pen, otherwise it would dump out as you're writing it. Um, and then when you have it down, it's more or less open uh, uh, at the top. So when you clean it, you want to have the nib in the down position. Um, so use an ink syringe, or you can have it at your sink with just like a tiny little stream of water. You know, just get some, get some water in here. You don't fill it all the way. Get it so there's a little bit of water, a little bit of air. And then just basically take your finger and cover the hole 
and just shake it back and forth like crazy. Just like you're, when you're cleaning out a converter or anything like that, you just shake it, you know, and then take it and then dump the water out. And you basically just do that over and over again. Get some clean water in there, shake it, dump it out. Get some clean water in there, shake it, dump it out. It's super annoying. Um, this is not the pen that I would recommend for you to do all of your ink sample testing with, for example. Get a pen that's easier to clean. Um, eyedropper pens in general are not best for things like testing ink samples and all that. I like cartridge and converter pens for that because you can use a bulb syringe and just push, blast it and flush it out. Um, but that's basically the process, right? If you uh, are doing that and you're still getting colored water that's coming out, you need to keep doing it. <laughs> and you're probably gonna have to do it like 20 times. Um, but that's basically the process of how it works. Um, if you wanna do a more thorough cleaning, then you need to completely disassemble the pen. Um, and I'll do a very, very quick demonstration. Nathan has like an hour and 10 minute video on how to do it, but I'm gonna try and do it much shorter time. So um, the way this pen works, you can see here it's got the barrel and then the back part of the pen actually slides back and forth. It's connected to a rod that connects to the whole thing. So you unscrew this portion of the back of the barrel, okay? So I'm holding onto the end here and I'm unscrewing it and it can be kind of tight. So it might take a little bit of work. And if you are like not handy at all, uh, don't even try this. <laughs> don't even get the pen because um, it's a tinkerer's pen. Um, it's got to kind of slide over the back, but then this, this barrel part just slides right off the front of the pen, okay? Now I'm left with this. You can see that rod now that's connected to the uh, nib, right? Um, this part took me some work, but you got to grip the, um, this part right here, this rod, and then you unscrew this knob off the end. And that allows the rod to be free. And then there's another, uh, you know, kind of collar that unscrews right here that slides off. And that collar allows you to then pull the nib unit um, out of here. And then when you see the nib unit inside, I'll show you kind of what's going on. Um, when you see the nib unit here, you can see how kind of Nathan's designed it. I'm really leaning over the desk here. Oh, it's hard to talk like this. Um, but you can see how this thing is designed. So here at the back is the rod. This is all the ebonite here. And this part, when the pen is all the way up forward in the pen, uh, when the nib is up all the way in the pen, this part is is choked off so the ink doesn't come dumping out of it. So he has these holes cut in the back here and that allows the ink to flow through, go to the back of the feed and travel down the pen. So when you pull this thing out, this whole thing is just gonna be covered with ink in here. Um, and because you've got like so much going on in here, this pen doesn't have a huge ink capacity, excuse me, it's just about a mil, maybe a little bit more than a milliliter. But it is a pretty dang cool design and it allows you to use some different types of inks in it. Um, and then when you're reassembling the thing, I've now got all these pieces everywhere. You just take the nib unit, shove it in there, take the little collar piece, make sure the O-rings haven't come off the, the rod. Take that collar piece, screw that in place, um, and then take the piston knob on the back, screw that on. And then I've got this shroud, um, which I could have put on first, but I'm just sliding it over the end. It can go either way. That goes on, and then it screws on. You don't need any tools. You might need a grip, or like an old bicycle tire, or a garden hose. Well, that probably wouldn't work as well. Rubber bands could work. Really any rubber grippy thing. Um, and then voila. Super easy to clean and maintain. Nathan's pretty darn good about that. Um, very fascinating, interesting pen. We are not gonna have enough of a supply of them now that I'm talking about it. And, showing everybody how to have fun with it, but it's a tinkerer's pen for sure. And if anything that I just showed you terrifies you, do not get the pen. There's way too many other great pens you can have fun with that are not gonna be as frustrating for you as that if you're not into it. All right, and then to close out this week, let's do a business question. This is from Mike P on Facebook. Brian, how important a role do you think the Goulet Pen Company YouTube videos and social media presence has played in promoting the business and creating a direct communications pipeline to potential customers. Well, Mike, you know, this is probably going to be stating the obvious a little bit, but I feel that it's pretty important. <laughs> um, you know, basically, if you don't have a social media presence or YouTube or any type of social media presence, especially as an e-commerce company, uh, you basically are going to have a hard time existing 
the way that things are going in 2018. So um, really it was, it was uh, I had no other option. I had no money for advertising. I had no marketing experience per se. Um, you know, what was I gonna go around and like knock on doors or do a yellow page ad or something? Like there was really no other option for me uh, at the time that we started Goulet Pens than to do social media and YouTube videos because um, essentially all they cost was time and effort uh, and they didn't cost anything financially. These days it's a little bit different. You know, a lot of the social media platforms now are a little more pay to play. You know, just for you to show up in a Google shopping feed, for example, now you have to pay to be there. Um, it didn't used to always be that way. You know, now if you have a Facebook business page, um, only one to three percent of your people that actually follow you even are going to see any of the content that you post just because it's the way that YouTube is, or sorry, that Facebook has changed their algorithm. Um, that's at least the state of things in 2018. Um, and now it's to the point where if you want to be seen, you have to boost all the content that you put out. You have to run ads and stuff like that to be able to get your content in front of other people. So um, things have shifted a little bit just as platforms have matured and developed. Um, you know, a lot of businesses could uh, complain about that, but it's really no different than, you know, if you have any other type of advertisement. If you're a local business and you want to run an ad in a magazine or you have a billboard or whatever, like you have to pay for that too. So the whole misnomer of like, you know, social media and having to pay for it and have a presence there and stuff like that. I was, um, I was much more hard fast about not paying for anything because I was very romantic about it. And I was like, if it's social media, it should be free. I mean, of course it costs money to run these platforms and they have huge data servers and staff and like they have to pay for things. Like, so yes, um, there's a really good saying, uh, and I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, I know, but there's a really good saying that says, um, if you're not the customer, then you're the product. <laughs> and that's something always interesting to keep in mind. Uh, whenever you're using a free app or a free, you know, anything, uh, you know, you're, you're essentially the product, which means they're, they're advertising to you uh, and they are, um, you know, that's, that's largely the model that most social media uh, companies have gone with is they let you use the amazing service for free um, and then they sell ads to businesses and stuff and serve the ads up to you, the, the um, you know, whatever. Uh, I guess in that instance, the business would be the customer. But um, so um, the way that we have used social media largely has been for engagement. Um, and stuff like that and creating direct communications pipeline as you say um, that has been the nature of it only recently have we gone to really paying for much of anything so um, we're trying to get a little more sophisticated just as the platforms have developed in that way and I used to be very proud of the fact that I was like we never pay for anything and then it got to the point where like everything was getting kind of flat and I was like well, we're not paying for everything, but it's also not going as far and doing the same thing that it used to. We kind of got on the social media thing early when not paying was fine and you would still reach all your, your people that wanted to see your content. Now, things have shifted a little bit, so I'm like, okay, I gotta be a little more practical here. Um, there's people that want to see our content that I need to pay for them to be able to see the content that they want to see. That to me makes sense. I'm not trying to like hammer it down people's throats and scam people because there is some of that that goes on in all forms of marketing. Um, but I try to still hold our values to it, but get it out there. So um, YouTube videos specifically have been really important for us. Um, you know, it allows us to show kind of the human side, the personality, the education. Um, you know, I can have more of my team on so you get a sense of, you know, Drew example, for example, has been on here multiple times and he's our head of customer care. So, you know, you know that his kind of stamp is gonna be on the customer experience here. Um, and you get a better picture of kind of how we do that based on his interactions of being on here and, and my interactions and all that. And it kind of, even though you might not be talking to me directly, you get a sense of kind of what might go on in our company just based on my knowledge and my values and all this kind of stuff. And, and that's really cool. You can have that come across in video uh, then in a different way than you can in other, in other mediums. You know, we're big on basically all the major mediums, uh, you know, right, the written word, audio, video, and pictures, right? Like those are most of your methods of communication um, channels. And uh, we, we kind of, we, we invest a lot of time and energy in all of them. We got an amazing team that is really good at all of them. <laughs> um, you know, but for me, I found that, that video is really a strong medium for me just because 
you know, I do really well in video and I don't get, I don't get nervous really. Um, and I'm okay just kind of sitting down and talking for an hour and however 10 minutes now that I've been going. Um, and that's really cool. And, and you all kind of build that into your routine with these Q and A's and, and it's, it's, there's like a friendship there. There's, it's kind of like we're sitting here and you might be cleaning your pens or you might be, you know, relaxing after a hard week or you might be, you know, finishing up your homework and you just kind of want some white noise at the end of the week here uh, as you're kind of winding down and, and all that. And, and so video allows me to kind of be a part of your ritual in a way that it, maybe I wouldn't be otherwise. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Um, so video is really important. It's going to continue to be really important. Um, social media presence very, very important in all major platforms. They're going to shift. They're going to change over time as they already have been. Um, but it's going to continue to be kind of a, a core focus of ours as we move forward because it allows us to be more directly in communication with you all and more in the grassroots of the community uh, than I think would ever have been possible uh, prior to these platforms existing. So we love it and we're going to keep it up. All right, my question for you this week uh, to wrap up the Q&A, uh, given that, you know, we have a storm that's impending upon us, I'm pretty much banking on the fact that we're going to lose power this weekend. Um, and it got me thinking because my kids are like actually really excited. <laughs> my kids are six and eight. They're really excited for a storm to come so that we can lose power because then we get to do like play board games by candlelight and just like really, you know, kind of fun things like that as a kid that create memories. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious to you, like, do you have any kind of ritual or like whenever you lose power and like you cannot be watching YouTube videos or doing your normal digital stuff, you know, what do you do to entertain yourself when you lose electricity? I'm just kind of curious. So leave that in the comments. That's the question of the week. And then a writing prompt for you. Maybe if you're losing power and you need a writing prompt, uh, something that you can write about using your pens on paper this weekend. Um, write about a time when someone did a random act of kindness for you. Uh, for me personally, I had one time, Rachel and I were eating dinner at a restaurant, very nondescript evening, um, and somebody just randomly came up and like brought us flowers. And it was like, a, they had a note card and everything, like, this is a random act of kindness. Someone did this to me, so I'm doing this for you. And they just like gave us flowers and they just let us know, like, this is a random act of kindness. We hope you have a great day. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. Um, so I'm just kind of curious if you've ever had that happen to you and you can write about that in your writing prompt. That's it for Q&A this week. You can check out uh, a lot of the stuff that I talked about here on GoulayPens.com. Be sure to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Um, I hope that everybody stays safe from the storm. If you're going to be dealing with that or wherever else you might be dealing with, um, just keep everybody in your thoughts. And I hope you have a great weekend and a fantastic rest of your week. Right on. Thank you.